Amen. You have a Bible, I'd love for you to get it out and get with me to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we're doing a series on the Sermon on the Mount, and I've been reminded repeatedly this week what a tremendous privilege it is to preach, and specifically to be able to preach on these amazing subjects. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed it this week especially, so the preparation process was uh, exciting. Now, whether or not it comes across that way is to be determined, but man, the Lord and His way of um, living out the kingdom righteousness, it really is profound and beautiful. So let's go ahead and read now Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 48, then we'll pray and we will get to work. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let's pray. Lord, we ask right now that by your Spirit, through your Word, we would hear your voice. We pray, Lord, acknowledging the high demand that you're placing on us as kingdom citizens, and we're admitting our need for a divine work within our hearts. Help us to be these kinds of people, the kind of people who can return good for evil, the kind of people who can love and pray for our enemies. Help us to be more like you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have here two different sections, and the first has to do with this idea of non-retaliation. And then the second has to do with love for enemy, and they go hand in hand, but they are very profound. And so the, the idea that comes across first is this idea of non-retaliation. And the common teaching that was prevalent in that first century was this idea of get even. And so look at verse uh, 38 there where it says, you have heard that it was said. Here's kind of the popular level teaching in that day. You've heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. So that was the common teaching. It was a, it was a passage from Exodus chapter 21, and uh, it was a concept that became called lex talionis. It means the law of retaliation. The, the law, so the Latin is lex talionis, but it's really just the law of retaliation. And he's saying, you've heard it taught in this way that it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. In other words, if somebody does wrong to you, you can match that. You can, you can get them back. We say it, you know, contemporary way of saying it is, you don't get mad, you get even, right? And so we, we look at opportunities where we feel wronged and we say, okay, the Bible actually encourages me to get back at that person, to retaliate. And Jesus is saying, wait, 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 hold on. Have you read Exodus chapter 21? Do you understand the intent of those laws? Because you're actually doing the exact opposite of what it's suggesting there. So he says, verse 39, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. You see, he's recognizing that the Old Testament law code, that idea of lex talionis, it wasn't this idea of if somebody hurts you, you get back at them. The law itself was designed to restrict personal vengeance. It was designed to restrain people from taking matters into their own hands and trying to get even. And that's why it had this correspondence between the offense and 
the justice that would be doled out. And so he's saying the, the truth of this law is it, it is meant to restrain personal vengeance. It, it was meant to take the, um, the warrant out of the hand of the offended party. Because here's, here's the deal. Somebody who's offended is dangerous. Somebody who's upset is very unlikely to accurately perform justice. And so the Old Testament recognized that, and it said Exodus 30, uh, 21 was actually written to the judges. Here's what it would look like for you to actually handle the situation in a way that would result in true justice. So the law itself was meant to prevent personal vengeance, not encourage it. And they were using it in the exact opposite way. The Bible tells me I can get even. The Bible tells me if somebody hurts me, I can hurt them back in proportion. But again, an offended person is a dangerous person, so the Bible actually is meant to prevent that. It reminded me of a, I was watching a basketball game a handful of years ago, an NBA game, and um, what happened was it was the Bulls versus the Bucks, and I know that we're right on the state line, so we're probably a mixed bag in here of, you know, which teams we appreciate. And it'll be interesting then, if you can recall this event, how you, the narrative that you assigned to it. But during the basketball game, there's a veteran player who is, he's kind of a little bit of a dirty player uh, and known for that. And there was a basketball play and he kind of fouled this player. The player falls down, no call, the shot goes up, the rebound happens, and it goes down to the other end of the floor. But this player that got knocked down was so upset. This is where this idea of non-retribution needs to come in play. Because when you're offended, you usually don't just get even. You, you want to hurt them even more. And so this player sprinted the full, what is it, 90, 90 feet that a basketball court is? From one corner of the basketball court to the, other, the full other end in the corner, and he speared that player. Like, it would look like a football tackle. And you realize, like, when somebody is offended, that's their natural inclination. I don't just want to get even, I want to inflict pain on that person. They did harm to me, and so I'm at least going to match that. But in truthfulness, if we're honest, we say, I don't just want to match it, I want to go well beyond it. I want to hurt them in such a way that they would never consider doing that again. Well, the Old Testament is, is restricting that, and it's saying, when you feel upset, Make sure that you don't go beyond the offense itself. Make sure that you don't miscarry ju justice here by taking matters into your own hands and inflicting harm on the other person. Here's another feature of the Old Testament that points in this direction. If you were to sue somebody, this is an interesting thing. This is that lex talionis idea. Like we're going we're gonna to restrict personal vengeance. So in the Bible, there's a section where it talks about if you take someone to court and you say, you're going to pay me for the harm that, I, that has been inflicted to me, the law was designed in such a way that if, if that if the trial went in the direction of you as the accuser could not prove the defendant to be you know, guilty of whatever it is that you're saying, they would not only be free from that suit, you would actually have to pay for what you're demanding. That will quickly discourage lawsuits, will it not? Imagine a society where if you knew that if you were going to sue somebody, you had to be absolutely certain that what you were demanding and, and what they did correspond and that they actually did it. So if I'm sitting in you know, the parent pickup line at school, somebody bumps into me, you know, so the, Everyone's on their phones waiting for the kids to come out. Somebody bumps into my car, and I get out, and I go, come on, dude, what's the, what's the problem here? And I look at my car, and I go, I'm going to sue you. I'm going to sue you for the damages of my car, and I'm going to sue you for the damages of the inconvenience. And it goes to court, and they go, okay, what you're suggesting here is excessive, and it was an, it was an accident. There was a malfunction of their car. So whatever it is that I was requesting, they wouldn't just be free. I would actually have to pay the court for what I was demanding. See, that will discourage retaliation. That's how the law was meant to function. And in the first century, they're saying, I'm going to take scripture and I'm going to make it say the exact opposite. I'm not just going to get mad. I'm going to get even. And so Jesus is saying, I tell you, here's the true intention of the law, the deeper meaning. Here's what I tell you. Do not resist an evil person. 
And then he begins to outline it by using a handful of different examples to to make his point very clear. First off, he says, one of the ways that a kingdom citizen can respond to offense is they can actually offer more than what's demanded of them. Look, Look with me at the end of verse 39. It says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Now, I grew up with three brothers. Here's what happens when you get hit. You quickly try to figure out who hit me. I'm going to hit them back, right? That's just reactionary, retaliatory behavior. If you get hit, you quickly figure out who's getting hit right back. And I'm going to make sure it really hurts them. And that, that retaliatory behavior, unfortunately, it doesn't just go away, right? It's, it's a feature in our human hearts where when we get hurt, we want to hurt other people back. And so I'll give you just a, a, an example from this week. I was giving my kids a, a bath, and um, we've got a little water pitcher, a little plastic water pitcher in there. So after, you know, they're soaked up and shampooed and all of that, you can rinse them off. And we get done with the whole bath portion of it, and they're just playing. And so I'm doing the crummy dad thing, and I'm looking at my phone. And I'm sitting beside the tub, and they're playing, and they're taking the pitcher and putting toys in there. And all of a sudden, I'm just playing on my phone, and I get water poured all over me, all over the floor. So I get up. This is that retaliatory spirit. I get up and I, I don't physically do anything to my kids, but verbally I use very sharp words. And I use words that are meant to inflict harm, right? Because I'm, I'm now wet and I'm looking at the floor and then I'm realizing the caulk that I put on the bottom, bottom of the tub that's meant to keep everything waterproof is not actually sealed the appropriate way. So I'm just kind of in that moment retaliating, and I'm, I'm using my words in a way that is harmful and hurtful. And I have to later apologize to my kids for that. But that retaliatory spirit, that's very much a feature of who we are. When something doesn't go our way, our immediate reaction is to say, how can I, how can I return harm to them? How can I get them back? How can I make them feel, however I'm feeling, I want to make them feel that too. And that can be with a child, it can be with a coworker, it can be with anybody who does harm to us. But Jesus says, here's how a kingdom citizen can respond in a moment like that. When you're slapped on the cheek, do you know what you can do? You can offer up the other cheek. And I was thinking about it this week and, I'm, and I was just realizing, I don't think this is a smug thing. I don't think he was saying, when you're slapped on your cheek, you're kind of like, you want to try this one on too? I don't think you're kind of smug about it and offering that up. I think there's a sincerity about it, as we'll see the rest of these illustrations unfold. I think there's something about a kingdom citizen who's able to look at the wrong that's been done and go, if you're that mad at me, that you would slap me in my face, is there, is there anything else to which is offending you? Is there anything else that I've done which might still be a lingering offense against you. And you're willing to even go deeper with that person. That's the kind of thing that I think Jesus is suggesting here. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Verse 40, he says, And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If you find yourself in a lawsuit as a kingdom citizen... What, what you should be doing is not seeking to justify your behavior or defend yourself. He's saying, look, a kingdom citizen is able to actually say, if I've done something that grievous against you, then, then I'm not just going to give you my shirt. I'll give you my cloak as well, which when Jesus is saying this, it's meant to be surprisingly provocative because the Old Testament actually has a law against this. Nobody can demand your cloak. That was a feature in you know, in biblical history, that was a security for a person. You couldn't take somebody's cloak because it was such an important item of clothing to them. So the law actually would not allow for somebody to sue you for your cloak. And Jesus is saying, if you find yourself in a lawsuit, go well beyond what they're asking for and be willing to offer up anything, anything, even the things that you might feel are most dear to you. That is different. Okay, whatever he's describing here is radically different than anything I'm familiar with. Jesus is telling us something about this different way of life that kingdom citizens perform. He goes on to say, if anyone forces you to go one mile with them, 
go with them two miles. This was something that was going on in the first century where if a military soldier were walking by and you were mowing your lawn and the soldier recognized that they needed help carrying some stuff, they could, they could, const- they could bring you on board, legally speaking, so that you would have to carry their gear f- for them, but the law only provided them to do that for up to a mile. And at that point, they'd have to release you from that obligation. And he's saying, look, if, if you're sitting there minding your own business and somebody ropes you into what they're doing legally, they say, you have to carry my stuff. And they say, we're going to go the full distance, the full mile. A kingdom citizen is able to say, I won't just go one mile, I'll go two. I won't just carry it as far as the, the law will require. I will go much further. I will even double the amount that you're requiring from me. Verse 42 He goes on to say, give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Again, in the Old Testament, there were all kinds of provisions to to try to protect people from lending money, from, from borrowing money to people, all kinds of different legal provisions that would give legitimate excuses for why you wouldn't do this. And Jesus is saying, kingdom citizens don't have to lean on those laws. In fact, we can be generous. We can voluntarily give of our resources and our possessions. So if somebody is asking us for something, we are able to turn toward them, not away from them, and give to the one who wants to borrow. So Jesus has given us four different examples then of how the kingdom citizen is to behave. And we we have to ask the question, what, what is the principle here? What is he trying to teach us here? And we can't be too literalistic about it, right? We can't be sitting around going, okay, Jesus taught us that, um, you know, we need to do these different things. And so I'm looking for that moment where I'm mowing my lawn and the soldiers walk by and ask me to carry their stuff. Like, we don't even have that law, so that would never, ever happen. Or you, you might be thinking, you know, if I ever land in a, in a lawsuit and they're asking for some stuff, you know what I'm going to do? Yes, you may have my money, and oh, by the way, I'm going to give you my jacket. They will be thoroughly unimpressed, right? There's a, there's, a, there's a principle here that goes beyond merely literally applying these things. So what is that? What is Jesus communicating here? What's the point here? Well, he is suggesting then that kingdom citizens are able to go well beyond what is expected of them, what is required of them. They are able to serve and bless people with the generosity of Christ himself. They are not to seek personal vengeance. They're not to seek personal vengeance, but instead they're actually to bless people who are seeking to harm them. So Jesus is saying here, not only should our retaliation be restrained, it is not even necessary. And one of the things that we can do as kingdom citizens is we can be a blessing to people who are seeking to harm us. We can serve people in a way that is super natural. Now, if you feel like this is unreasonable and maybe even impossible, I think you're right. I don't think you're going to march out of here today thinking, oh, I I will definitely go and do this stuff. I will definitely go and be a blessing to those who are seeking to harm me, and I can do it in my own strength. I just don't see that when I read this. I feel this incredible desperation that any of us who are being honest should be willing to say, this would be a work of God. If we're going to behave in this sort of way, this will not be natural at all. This will be supernatural. It will be divine. Well, that principle there, it is applied in the New Testament in Romans chapter 12, where it reads like this, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Goes on to talk about how as far as it is possible, as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And then it talks about how we are those who do not seek personal revenge. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, this is how kingdom citizens behave. If your enemy is hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Kingdom citizens are the kinds of people who, when we experience personal injury and harm, we don't retaliate. We don't take vengeance 
we bless, we serve, we care, we love. Grant Osborne puts it like this, instead of demanding our rights and seeking justice over every wrong perceived or otherwise, kingdom citizens expect little from this world and place their trust wholly in God. Jesus is teaching this idea of non-retaliation, but even more than that, he's teaching us the idea of love. Let's look at that second paragraph there. It's teaching us about this idea of love for enemy. Look at verse 43. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Here's the common teaching. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And that is drawing from Leviticus 19. It's this this legitimate passage that says, love your neighbor. And then they added that, you know, little qualification on there too. They're they're drawn from other places in the scripture. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And that became kind of the popular level teaching. This is what God wants. He wants us to love our neighbors and to hate our enemies. And Jesus is saying, again here, you're missing the point. You're misapplying the scriptures. You're adding to what the scriptures are actually saying here. He says, verse 44, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. The love for neighbor is not meant to be narrowly restricted to people that you like. It's not meant to be narrowly defined by the people who are like you, who think like you, who share your worldview, that you just naturally, you know, enjoy spending time with. I was, I was thinking about it this week. In my neighborhood, there's a pocket, uh, we're, we're in a corner of the neighborhood, and There are a handful of houses, and we all hang out together. I really, really enjoy my literal neighbors on one side. And we go on vacations together. We've got kids that are the same ages, going to the same school. And, uh, you know, it's just easy to hang out with them. But then I was thinking about this idea of neighbor love, and I was reminded that God might be saying, hey, Cor, what about those other homes? What about the other people around you who aren't in the same stage of life and don't have, you know, the same affinities as you do. What about those other neighbors? Because when we define neighbor, God is not wanting us to try to restrict it and go neighbor for me means the people I like. And that's exactly what was happening in the first century. Love your neighbor, but you're free to hate your enemies. Love your neighbor, but go ahead and hate those that you do not like. Treat them with contempt. Jesus is saying, no, you're missing the point here. I want you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is the true intention of the law. In another place in in, um, the gospel, somebody asks him, because Jesus has a habit of saying loving God and loving neighbors is a very, very significant and important reality, the greatest of commandments. And so somebody has the audacity to say, okay, well, who is my neighbor? Like, who, who am I obligated to love like that? And he tells a story, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. He says, a man is going down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he gets mugged. And he gets beaten and robbed and left for dead. And when a fellow kinsman comes by, somebody who's like him, somebody who, you know, shares the same ethnicity and heritage and worldview and all these different things, when, when a person comes by and sees him in need on the side of the road, left for dead, that person excuses themselves and goes around and goes off to their, their whatever it is that they were busy doing. And then a second individual comes by, another kinsman, another like-minded individual, sees the person laying there, left for dead, robbed, and excuses himself and goes around on the other side. And then Jesus says, but a third person comes by, and that third person was not a kinsman. It was a Samaritan. It was the enemy. It's the bad guy. It's the guy that you, ha- that you have a natural contempt for. You, you hate this kind of person. All Samaritans are awful people in the mind of a first century Jew. And he says, the Samaritan came by, saw him in need, took him up, put him on his own donkey, transferred him to a place of refuge, treated him medicinally, and then financially footed the bill for his long-term care. And Jesus says, who do you think was a neighbor to the man in need? And the answer is very obvious. It's the Samaritan. The problem is that shatters our categories of neighbor and enemy. All of a sudden, we're dealing with this reality that Jesus thinks we ought to love people that we're naturally inclined to hate. 
And we actually ought to love people that we would normally treat with contempt. And so Jesus is saying here, what I'm telling you the law really suggests is that you should love your enemies and you should pray for those who persecute you. You should pray for them. John Stott puts it like this. He says, when we pray for people, it changes us. He says, it is impossible to pray for someone without loving them and impossible to go on praying for them without discovering that our love for them grows and matures. When we think about those people that we would consider our enemies, we need to be praying for them. And by doing so, it's actually changing our hearts. We we will begin to see them in in a different way. We will begin to love them appropriately. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, if you're familiar with him, he was a pastor and a theologian, a German pastor and theologian during the time of Nazi Germany. And his faith commitments led him to obviously oppose Nazism. And ultimately, it led to his martyrdom. He was hung in a concentration camp just weeks before that concentration camp was liberated. But he, wrote, he spoke on the Sermon on the Mount, and he wrote this about this teaching. And he said this, The command that we should love our enemies and forego revenge will grow even more urgent in the holy struggle which lies before us. The church, which is really waiting for its Lord, and which discerns the signs of the times of decision, must fling itself with utmost power into this prayer of love. Can you imagine hearing Bonhoeffer teach on that in Nazi Germany? You see, we, we want to we qualify it. Yeah, God wants us to love our enemies, but Jesus can't really mean that we're supposed to love the bad guys, right? Well, he can't really mean that we should be praying for them. So let's make it, let's make it a little bit more personal. We're, we're in such a divided time in our nation that it is very easy to determine who we think the bad guy is. It's the person who voted different than you. And you might think they're ruining our great nation. And you would have different reasons to fill that thing in. And you might be tempted then to qualify that Jesus would ask you to love and pray for your enemies. You go, no, 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 no. He wouldn't want me to pray for them. They're bad. They're awful. But here's the truth. Jesus is suggesting that. He is calling us to love our enemies. He's calling us to look at people who we are naturally inclined to treat with contempt. And he's saying, you, as a kingdom citizen, you are to love them. And you are to pray for them even if they are persecuting you. You are to care for them in that sort of way. Here's the reason why. By doing so, you're behaving like your heavenly father. Look at what it says in verse 45. Here's the motivation for it. That you may be children of your father in heaven. Here's how you do it. You behave like him. Here's why you do it. It's because this is how he operates. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. This is how God orchestrates his world. If you were to wake up tomorrow and the sun doesn't come out, and you're like, oh, that's a bummer, and then you get up the next day and the same thing happens, the sun doesn't come out again, and then the next day the same thing and over and over again, and you begin to pray to God, why, why isn't your sun shining on the world? And he says, well, if you guys would shape up, then I'd give you my sun. Then I would shine some light on the world. No, 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 that's not how God operates. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. The ordinary way in which he operates with the world that he has made is such that he displays his kindness to those who are good and those who are evil. It's an indiscriminate kindness. He is able to love his enemies and care for them. And so when Jesus is calling us to love our enemies and pray for them, he's asking us to behave like God. He's calling us to emulate our heavenly Father. This is what God does. Romans 5 puts it like this. While we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. While we were enemies, not not when we decided we would clean our lives up and get our acts together, then we were saved. No, no, no. While we were enemies, God sent his son to die in our place. And we were reconciled through the death of that son. So what Jesus is inviting us to do is to behave like God, to love 
our enemies, to bless and serve those who are seeking to do harm, to pray for those who are persecuting us, and by doing so, to be more and more like our Father. Verse 48 puts a little bow on it here, and it says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. It's an invitation to live this incredibly divine way of life. And this becomes a major emphasis in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. A lot of the things that we'll learn in the coming weeks, it'll be tied to this idea. We want to be mindful of our Heavenly Father, the kind of character that He has, and and the kind of reward that we will receive when we are faithful to Him. So, be like God. Love enemies. Pray for them. Seek to do good for them. But before we close, He asks a couple of rhetorical questions that I think are really significant because we, we have to wrestle with this. So he asks in verse 46, basically what he's saying is, are you doing this? He says, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? Do you, do you love people who are just like you, but nothing more? Do you love people that are easy to love? People who reciprocate that love? Do you love those who love you? What reward will you get? I mean, that's just or, that's, that's the normal stuff of being a human. Somebody shows you love, you return the favor. Even tax collectors can do that. Verse 47, if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Unbelievers can do that too. If you love people who are like you, that's, not, that's ordinary. There's nothing special about that. But listen, Jesus is inviting us to love in a way that is extraordinary. To love our enemies. To love those who are different from us. To love those who have a different worldview. To love people that we might be tempted to say, well, well I can't really love them. They don't share my Christian values. They, they, don't, they don't think like me. In fact, they, they have a totally different worldview. And Jesus is saying exactly, love them. Love them. Love others. One commentator puts it like this. He says, to return evil for good, that's devilish. Somebody does good to you, you inflict harm to them, that's, that's acting like the devil. To return good for good, that's human. That's just normal stuff. If somebody does good to you, you return the favor. But he says, to return good for evil, that's divine. God is asking us to live a divine way of life, to love others our enemies, and to pray for them. And the reason why we can do this is because we're following a king who did exactly that. He went to the cross and he loved the undeserving. He went to the cross and he died for you and I, our enemies. And by doing so, he was reconciling us to the Father. He was able to pray like this. It was a, it was a kangaroo court. It was a miscarriage of justice. They took him, they stripped him naked. They beat him, they spit on him, they pulled out his beard And he graciously endured that for you and I. In closing, let me just read what Peter had to say about this. He said, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, He entrusted entrusted himself to him who judges justly, and he bore our sins in his body on the cross. That is the good news of the gospel. So let's be good news people. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love for us, your sacrificial love that was willing to die on the cross to bring us into a right relationship with God the Father. And you were willing to do that while we were enemies. You were willing to do that while we were far off. So help us begin to live like that in the here and now. Help us to forego personal vengeance when we feel slighted or wronged. Help us instead to love our enemies and pray for them. And not only to do that, but to sincerely do good for them. Help us to be more like you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.